Hello and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, in the last few weeks I've reviewed an awful lot of Flat Earth videos, and one thing that is just very consistent throughout all of these and the interviews with prominent Flat Earth uh, proponents and such is that there seems to be a very limited understanding of basic physics principles, things like motion and inertia. And I thought that I would just do a quick video explaining a few of these so that maybe uh, folks will get a little better understanding of them. So let's have a look at this video by D. Marble. Uh, he seems to have a lot of these misconceptions and puts them out in this video. So it's a good place to just kind of gather them all up and then try and address them all at once. Hey, what's up, folks? Here, it's January 8th. This is a really special day. This is Earth Rotation Day. Yep. You heard it. Earth's Rotation Day. January 8th commemorates the day that French physicist Leon Foucault supposedly demonstrated the rotation of the Earth. You see, according to the heliocentric model, which... Hey, Foucault must have proved it at some point, right? Uh, says that the Earth is, uh, one, rotating and tilted on its axis at 23.5 degrees. If you ever get a chance to go to Chicago, stop by the Museum of Science and Industry. This is their Foucault's pendulum. Now, watching this thing go back and forth is rather mesmerizing, but it's about as exciting as watching paint dry. So as you see, I've sped it up a little bit. Now the cool thing about this particular model is it has these keys on hinges all the way around the perimeter. As the Earth rotates underneath this pendulum, that pendulum will process in a clockwise manner and knock these keys off at a regular and predictable rate. So let's watch it go back and forth a little bit and it'll slow down when the critical moment starts to come in. Here we go. Now this is the normal speed of the pendulum. And there we go. I mean, personally, I don't really buy into the whole idea that the Earth is rotating at all, mainly because of my experience. I mean, I only experienced the Earth is flat and stationary, but I'd like to think that if the Earth were moving, I'd know it. Okay, we have here a pretty common fallacy, and that is that my senses are so attuned that I would notice the motion. In reality, we don't notice things unless a force is applied upon us. And here's a good example of how our senses can be fooled. Notice the, they're pouring a Coke here, but if you look outside the windshield, this plane is doing a 360 degree barrel roll during this process. And that's just one of many examples of how our senses can be fooled based on the forces that act on us. But anyway, there's other reasons uh, why I don't really buy into it. And one, that Foucault pendulum, that kind of needs a push from time to time. Um, and then that makes me think about other aspects of nature where uh, we drive past cranes. It's not constantly swinging. You think about um, a wrecking ball. You ever seen a junkyard where there's a wrecking ball just kind of suspended? Is it swinging because of the Earth's rotation? No. Now, Newton's first law of motion has two parts to it. One is a body at rest will remain at rest, and a body in motion will remain in motion unless an outside force acts upon it. In this example, a wrecking ball is already at rest on the rotating Earth. It's not going to move unless some other force is applied to it. Another reason why I don't buy into the whole concept of the Earth rotating is commercial flights. Well, what do I mean? Flights from the West Coast to the East Coast, flights from the East Coast to the West Coast, typically take about the same amount of time. Now, if the Earth were rotating eastward, flights from the West Coast to the East Coast would be a physical impossibility, and flights from East to West, well, I mean, they would be cut in... A, to a fraction of the amount of time that they normally take. But you see, uh, I've flown a lot from Seattle to Houston, and I've flown a lot from Houston to Seattle, and typically the flights take right about the same amount of time. And how's that work if the ground's moving beneath the airplane? Now, as we just discussed, Newton's first law of motion states that a body in motion 
will remain in motion unless acted upon by another force. So as these balloons are sitting on the ground, they are rotating with the Earth. Now as they lift off, that rotation continues and they basically go straight up. If Mr. Marble is correct, that balloon could go straight up, wait three hours, uh, and land on the other side of the country. And the reason that his flight between Houston and Seattle takes the same amount of time coming and going is that it's the same distance. So while these hot air balloons do not prove rotation themselves, they certainly do not disprove rotation, as Mr. Marble alludes. But back on to this whole not being able to feel it thing. This is where I hear the globe believers say, oh, you can't feel it because the atmosphere is rotating with us. Stop it. There's no proof of that. And if you can come up with some proof. Well, actually, we did just talk about Newton's first law of motion. So there's your answer there. But you wanted some more evidence of rotation. Here it is. I took this photograph over Lake Michigan this last weekend. And that's not lens flare. That is a sun pillar. You can very clearly see the beam of light going directly from the sun to the bottom of the clouds. That's not reflection, and it's um, not an artifact. And as Phuket Word confirmed the other day in a video, the sun lighting the clouds from underneath at sunset is proof of not only a spherical Earth, but a sunset due to rotation. Please bring it. I mean, because the story that we're told is that the Earth is spinning and the Earth is orbiting around the sun. The sun's pulling the whole solar system along through space with it. Not only that, the uh, whole Milky Way galaxy is moving and we can't perceive any motion at all. Now, this is an example of the logical fallacy of the argument from incredulity. Just because you can't wrap your head around it does not disprove the argument. Now, if you've ever been on a merry-go-round, then you would know that once the merry-go-round starts to spin, if you stand in the center of it, you're, you're not going to be as affected by the uh, force, okay? There, there's going to be that centrifugal force that's going to be pulling you towards the outside and ultimately going to fling you off of that merry-go-round. You know, you see guys take a motorcycle and they spin the merry-go-round really fast, and what happens to the people on the outside? Oh, they're holding on for dear life, and ultimately, they get flung off of that thing. Now, the guy in the center, he's probably got a better chance of staying on the merry-go-round because he's not as affected by centrifugal force. But, that's the way it goes, okay? So, if the Earth is so huge, uh, wherever you're spinning from the center, now, if you're at the north or south pole, which is tilted at 23.5 degrees on its axis then you're not going to experience as much spin. But if you're a little further towards the equator, you're probably going to feel the force of the spin a little bit more. But I've been pretty close to the equator. i uh, been to a few islands down there. Pretty close to the equator. Didn't feel any spin. Okay, Mr. Marble. As you know, with the rotating Earth, the equator has got a bulge of about 14 miles due to the effects of rotation. Now you can see this in weights as well. This is a reference 500 gram weight in Perth, Australia on an electronic scale. Going south on the same scale, that 500 gram weight weighs 500.16 grams. Turning around and going north of Perth, it's 499.44 grams. You are correct that things do weigh more at the poles than they do at the equator. And as you can see, it's a relatively small amount, about a third of a percent. But this finding here is absolute proof of rotation. This effect, however, is so slight that you certainly would not feel it. Yet we can easily detect it with instruments. And if the Earth is spinning a thousand miles per hour at the equator and you move further north or south of the equator, the spin supposedly slows down. But at the same time, let's say it's like 780 miles per hour. Know what kind of winds you would experience at 780 miles per hour? That would be none because you're spinning at the same speed. 
other reasons why you can tell that uh, the Earth is stationary and that I don't know, everything else in the sky is moving. Well, I mean, just take a look at this time lapse. I did quite a few time lapses last year. And in this one, you can tell uh, my camera is stationary in one spot on the beach. And I'm just watching the clouds move, watching the sun move. And it's pretty obvious that the sun and the clouds are moving. But wait a minute, according to the globe model, we're told that the sun isn't moving and that the earth is moving. So wait a minute. Wind is caused by air moving from areas of high pressure to low pressure. And yes, the sun is stationary. But back to this whole situation of me interpreting my reality, using my God given five senses to navigate where I live. My experience tells me that the earth is stationary. The human body has got five senses. These senses are sensitive, but they're not sensitive enough for precise measurements. For example, if you have a tree outside your house, you can't eyeball it and tell me the circumference within a tenth of an inch. The other thing that we have to remember is relativity. Yes, the surface of the Earth is moving a thousand miles an hour at the equator, but everything else is too. Simply because you don't notice something does not mean it's not happening. I guess that makes you crazy to trust your own senses to interpret reality. Maybe, maybe not. Yes, you are crazy to trust your own senses. Aircraft have instruments for flight in bad weather. That's because we cannot reliably tell which way is up if we can't see outside. Now, if you want to learn more about rotation of the Earth and how you can measure it or detect it from the ground, I have a video that gives six different ways that you can do it without any equipment. Now, just to continue our visit with Dee Marble, let's have a look at his laser observation across Puget Sound. All right, so now to get started, let's look at our positions on the water. Now, Mark was at Owen Beach at Point Defiance Park, and I was positioned at Saltwater State Park in Des Moines, Washington. Now, here are his results demonstrating flatness of Puget Sound and also his undoing. So let's have a little closer look at this. All right, so the distance between these two points is 10.3 miles. Mark's going to say in a little bit that he's about 7 feet above sea level. That gives us a target hidden height of 33.2 feet. Okay, so first of all, let's have a look at Owen Beach. As you can see very clearly here, the elevation of the beach is approximately 10 feet. Now, as you can see from the actual setup of the experiment, there's Mark down in the left lower corner with a flashlight. He's obviously a fully grown man, probably around six feet tall, and he is well below the level of the laser. So in reality, the laser is actually located 12 to 15 feet above sea level, something that could be easily measured. So rather than give a wishy-washy estimate, next time measure it, Daryl. We're going to go ahead and give you 12 feet for that laser and use an actual curve calculator that includes refraction. With standard refraction, uh, that laser will be about 17 feet over your head, and since your camera is on about a three-foot tripod, about 14 feet above you. Let's see him zero in the laser, and you tell me whether it's above him. Boom, boom, boom. All right, bring it to the right. Bring it to the right. A little bit. All right, stop right there. Bring it back a little bit. And there it is, the laser is well above his observation position. Now, pay attention to his screen as they sweep the laser back and forth. You can clearly see it pass above him. Boom, right there, right that's there. Perfect. perfect. Stay right Stay there. Right Stay right Stay there. Right there. Uh, honestly, what, what's your elevation right now? You're, you're in the water right now? I'm checking the heights right now. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's see. About seven feet off the water. Okay. At this point, I'm anticipating that someone suffering from cognitive dissonance is going to say, no, he was more than seven feet above sea level. Okay. So let's say eight and a half. Now, where's the other 30 feet of curvature? And then somebody else is going to say, no, he's higher than eight and a half feet. Okay, let's try 10. So where's the other 27 feet of curvature? Yeah, stop it. No, Daryl, we're just going to point out the fact you misrepresented your elevation didn't use the proper curve calculator. And then we're going to point out the fact that the laser passed over your head and you just caught a part of it. Now, at most, it took me perhaps 10 minutes to go through this entire experiment and take it apart. 
while it is a marginally interesting observation, it certainly is not a flat earth proof, and this is something that is easily possible on a globe. Because of this and other observations, I've decided that I'm going to make some changes in how I evaluate these videos. Refraction is a very real effect, as you can see right here. Now, granted, liquid butane is a little colder and denser than air, but we're dealing with three inches to generate the effect here versus over 10 miles for Daryl. With the next one, we've got a light behind this small jug, and just putting a little butane on it, you can see how easy it is to kind of bend that light over the curve. So the long and short of it is that refraction is a very real effect, especially when going over water. And when dealing with a relatively short observation like this one of 10.3 miles, uh, where you're dealing with a calculated curve of even 30 or 40 feet, it really is not conclusive evidence of flatness. To demonstrate that this occurs in the real world, here is the Monterey Beach mirror demonstration. As you can see, there is a mirror on the beach some 13 miles away from the observation point, yet the flash of the mirror occurs nearly 40 feet above sea level due to refraction. While this clip is rather difficult to see, this is the base of the power plant. That white object identified by the arrow is a car. You can best see it in comparison to the mirror flash in this short video segment. Although the mirror flash was at the level of the beach, it appeared at the level of the road some 40 feet above sea level. And this is all due to refraction. Refraction occurs when you have warm air over cold water on calm days. As you can see by Daryl's own temperature information from the day of his observation, the air temperature was some 10 degrees higher than the water temperature. As a result, a slight inversion was sent up and refraction was enhanced. Even on a very windy day, as in the Monterey Bay observation, refraction was quite significant. As a result, I've come to the conclusion that I will no longer evaluate any light over water uh, observations that occur over less than 40 to 45 kilometers. I don't think that a missing 20 or 30 feet of curvature is of any significance in proving a flat earth. At 45 kilometers, more than 100 meters of curvature should be encountered. If you have a sea level to sea level observation, over 40 to 45 kilometers. I think that's worth a look at. However, I'm not going to do any further evaluations on um, missing curvature for any distance less than that. This rabbit hole's too deep for me. Through my brain getting real sore. Besides God